So I'm glad you're here this morning. I need to give a quick disclaimer. Um, at the end of the sermon, I'm going to show a 2 minute and 26 second video. And if, if there are children with you, it, there's, uh, I mean, no cursing or nudity, but there is some graphic, a little bit of violence there in that video. And so if you, if you have children that are sitting with you and you'd like to cover their eyes or something of that nature, then, then feel free to do so. But I just want everybody to know that that is coming because truthfully, it is the best thing that I could think of, and I've been praying for something all week to show you present day what Christ was teaching 2,000 years ago. And so this is, this is just kind of what it is. Your, your title for the sermon today, it's not all fun and games. We're going to be covering, Lord willing, Mark chapter 8, verse 34, all the way through Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And I think I forgot to read verse 1 in the first service, but, but Lord willing, we will get there today. So some thoughts for you as we get started. How about Alabama football? Any Alabama football fans in here? Yeah, see? The, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an Alabama football fan. However, if you really need something from the music pastor here at the church at the beach while Alabama is playing football, you're not going to get it because you can text him and beg him and he'll just say, Pastor, will you just spend this time? Will you say, the Alabama fans love Jesus too. If you just pray for Alabama right now. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, well, evidently there are some God-fearing people in Michigan with that win y'all had yesterday finally over Ohio State. The... Uh, but Alabama football. See, I, I, I used to coach basketball, and occasionally I would interact with the basketball coaching staff at the University of Alabama. And when Nicky Saban got there, and he was just, you know, it may have taken him one year, but basically he just turned the whole ship around. It was unreal. And he is, like, you know, I'm not an Alabama fan, but he's the best in the business, right? Kirby might be moving up there pretty quickly, but, but Nick, Nicky's the best there is. So... I was talking with him, and we were talking about positive energy and negative energy and, and uh, good leadership with the basketball coach and staff, and somehow football came up, and one of the assistant coaches at the University of Alabama, <clears throat> he said to me, now, Jay, don't misunderstand anything you see or hear. They're not playing patty cake and bacon brownies over at the football facility at the University of Alabama. Things are not always fun and games. It's a process in order to become and be who you want to be, and for us as Christians to become and be who God wants us to become and be. 
I want to share with you, around the church house here at work Friday afternoon and yesterday, we've had some Wi-Fi issues. Uh, Brother Jerry is just so good, and he keeps all that running at a high level. And, and I got frustrated. Probably looking back, I went without Wi-Fi for maybe 10 seconds. No joke. And I, I was about, well, I, I was probably about to sin. I was so angry because I could not get this thing to come up on my computer screen the way I wanted it to. And so in the way that it should have. But we've become that way, haven't we? We want what we want, when we want it, how we want it. And you see, life's not always fun and games. And Christ, we're going to learn through the passage this morning, he, wasn't, he didn't send us here to this earth as his followers to be playing patty cake and just be baking brownies all the time. He's called us here to deny ourselves. And to take up our cross. And to follow him. You know, one of my friends from Georgia was here a few months ago. And she laughed and she said, Jay, I think you're Jesus' biggest cheerleader. And that's true, I am. But I'm not going to lie to you. No lies this morning. So maybe not as rambunctious as sometimes. Maybe not as fun as sometimes. Maybe not butterflies and great feelings about how much Christ loves you at the end of the service today. But it's going to be the truth. And we've, we decided, and by we, I mean God and me, decided to move through the book of Mark over the course of about a year and three months. And that means that I have to stand up and I have to preach every verse and every word, whether I want to or not. But this is a vital lesson for us today. If we are going to be the soldiers in God's army that we've been called to be. Now let's reflect back a little bit on some things that we've We've learned over the last couple of weeks in the book of Mark. If you'll remember last week, the, the, the climax theologically of Mark's gospel, of this letter, is Peter. Simon Peter, he, he, he answers Jesus and he says, you are the Christ. And if we read the, the account in the book of Matthew, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And the man, he had the facts. And sometimes as Christians, especially here in America, and I'm not trying to throw any stones, but especially here in America, we've got the facts. We know Jesus is God's son. Who all believes that? Me. Who all believes he died on the cross? Me. Who, who all believes he was resurrected? Me. Who all believes he's in heaven now? Me. Who all believes that God loves you? Me. Who wants to pick up their cross and follow him? I don't know about that. I didn't know that was part of the deal. But Jesus says that's part of the deal. And don't forget, it's his deal, not ours. So Peter and the apostles, they knew the deal. They knew the facts, but they didn't understand the process of being who God has called us to be. Now, I have to do this every couple months because if not, we'll lose track. We've got to remember when we study the Bible, we've got to know Mark's audience. Mark was writing this gospel. He was writing this letter to a church in the city of Rome. And this church was experiencing great persecution. They were being punished for being Christians. These Christians in this church in Rome would have known for sure Paul, and they might have known Peter. We think Peter made it to the city of Rome. The Bible doesn't specifically tell us that. But we think Peter made it to the city of Rome. And they have watched these two great men of the faith who knew Jesus Christ differently, but they both met him and knew him. They have watched these two men die and be executed for their faith in Christ. And here, these people that are reading Mark's account, they're reading and they know that Jesus has ascended into heaven. They know that the Holy Spirit is working there in their church. But it's hard to sit, well, look over this way and look over that way and watch your friends get their head cut off. It's hard to watch somebody that's your mentor be burned to death. It's hard to watch a brother or sister in the faith be sawed in half. And that's what this church was experiencing. And so Mark's writing and he takes them back to tell some stories about Christ's time here on this earth so that they will understand that Christ never promised you it was all going to be fun and games. He never promised you patty cake and bacon brownies. He said, if you stick with me to the end, I promise you I got it, baby. That's what Christ promised. 
And so that was the occasion for writing. There were cultural differences. For one, in the Roman God system, the system of the Roman gods, there was Jupiter. Now we would probably, we've heard the word Zeus before, but that was the chief god of all of the gods, you could say, in their pagan system of worship. And so there were some differences culturally in religion, but there are also some similarities. Because if, if we're not careful as Christians, we will lose track of who we are supposed to really be and who we are really supposed to be counting on, who is God himself, and we will start to invest our time and for sure invest our money in things like homes and things like houses and things like clothes and things like big elaborate fancy trips, things of that nature. And so if we're not careful, those things I just listed become our gods just the same way that in Rome, in the Roman Empire, those Roman gods but were their gods. What we do as humans, whether it be the Roman god system, the Greek god system, some type of Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Islam, whether it be atheism, whatever it is, we replace whatever we want with the one true God. We take him off his throne and we put whatever we decide should be up there. And culturally, that's the same today as it was 2,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and depending on when God created this earth, 8,000 years ago. So we have cultural similarities as well as cultural differences. But let's break down the passage. And I have to tell you, today, unpopular teachings in American churches. You're not going to hear this if you go to church in America. This is probably one of the, the passages in Scripture that preachers nowadays avoid like the plague. I don't want to preach on that. Nobody will show up the next week. I'm not going to get any amens. People are going to feel bad when they leave instead of feeling good, etc., etc., etc. So I just need to skip over this great teaching that Christ had for us that will help us in strengthening our faith. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Follow along with me in your Bibles. Did we do God is good? No. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad, oftentimes more during the bad times. And we're going to see the bad times are going to come. But his goodness is still there even when we cannot see his greatness. Verse 34. When Jesus had called the people to himself... With his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So Christ, what he has done is he has spoken to just the apostles. Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He told them that he was going to die, but then rise again on the third day. They didn't understand. They had this situation where Jesus basically, where Peter rebukes Jesus, and then Jesus has to say, Get behind me, Satan. All right, you're messing with a must. And I must go to Jerusalem, and I must die on that cross. So he's called everybody together, not just the apostles now. But now here's something as I was studying really hit me. He has just said, take up your cross and follow me. But for me, I, whenever I read the Bible, I always read it on this side, historically, of the cross. I'm always looking back at it. Okay, now... The, the people that are reading Mark's account, they could look back on, even though it would have just been several years, okay, less than 30 years, but they could look back on the cross too. But the people that were living right here with Jesus, they weren't looking or nothing in their brain could tell them that Christ was going to be dying on a cross in the next several months. So what was in their mind? So this is a difference in between us and them, fair enough? What they were thinking is this. We live in the city of Rome, and there are hundreds, probably, of at least a hundred roads coming out of the city of Rome. And when we go out of this city, going down these pathways, we see cross after cross after cross of criminals hanging there. And they've been beaten. Their flesh is hanging off of them. They can't move. Birds coming and eating parts of their flesh. And then, if need be, their legs are broken because the only way they can breathe is to push up with their legs to get some air in their lungs. And so, and then they would stay as long as they can until they have to have another breath. And so they would break their legs so they could no longer push up because, you know, you guys, even those of you that are really strong, you could only 
pull yourself up with your shoulders and arms so many times before finally you could do it no longer. You would asphyxiate. You would die on the cross. So these people weren't hearing and thinking of Jesus. When they heard this, they were thinking of themselves. They weren't thinking about picking up Jesus' cross. They were hearing Jesus' words and, and thinking, What? I've got to die? I have to be like those criminals that are hanging on the crosses as we leave the city? When I look at it through those eyes, it just hits me different as I study the passage. So, they didn't know what he meant by taking up a cross, and he said, follow me. If we're not careful, we'll think, follow me, he thinks, yeah, I'm following Jesus. He's walking, and I'm walking behind him. He's the mother duck, and I'm the little duckling. He goes this way, I go that way. That's not what follow me means. What follow me means, follow me means, is obey me. Do what I've told you to do. Be who I've called you to be. I've created you for a certain purpose at a certain time to do a certain thing. Step up and do it. Obey me. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. That's how we show God we love him. Our obedience. So Christ says, obey me. He also talks about that we need to, what's it, we need to deny oneself. See, we have this thing in our culture that's really looked up to called self-denial. Right, last night, I had, a, I had a, it was my son's birthday, so we went to Beef O'Brady's for lunch. And I ate the cheesy bacon pub chips, and I ate half a chicken sandwich, and then just to feel good of myself, I got a side salad with extra cheese and extra blue cheese dressing, because I'm sure the lettuce compensated for all the other stuff I ate. <laughs> so when we got home for dinner, Kara said, what do you want for dinner? I said, babe, no, no, no dinner for me tonight. I've already had enough calories. See, a little self-denial, health nut. But see, we, we applaud that, self-denial. When we abstain or we do without something for a little while, right? We do without it just for a little while for a good cause. I'm not as fat, gotten in my suit a little easier this morning than I did last week. Something like that, self-denial. But that's not what Christ commanded. He said deny oneself. And what that means is when you deny yourself, and when I deny oneself, what that means is that I'm going to exchange me for you. And that's a big difference, folks, because it's about his will, not our will. It's about admitting what I want is not really going to matter all that much, but if I'll do and live how you want, then the whole world can change just by one or two people. He didn't command us to do without dinner for an evening. He didn't command us to lay off the Oreo cake, which I didn't do that. I did eat the Oreo cake at lunch. He commanded us, exchange your own will for my will. That's hard for us. But your position, if you really are saved, if you're a Christian, this is your position, or you should be working towards it. Mark chapter 8, verses 35 through 37. For whoever, Christ is speaking still, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, don't forget that. All right, evangelism is included right there. He's saying you gotta be, you gotta lose your life for me and be willing to lose your life to get the good news of me out there for people to be saved. We'll save it. Verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? Folks, I want you to know that there is infinite worth on your soul. Your immaterial self. That, that whatever that is inside of you that you can't really touch. Now, I'm a believer. We're just one person. Flesh, blood, our soul. We're one human being that God has created. But there's an immaterial you that is in there that is worthless. Uh, of infinite worth. Almost said that wrong. God is saying, no matter what you can work for, no matter how much you can accumulate, no matter what pedestal people can put you on, and no matter how high ranking you are in the government, it does not matter compared to the price of a soul. And this day, right here, for the last 2,000 years, 
Satan and God have been battling over souls. They're not battling over your ankle or your knee or your shoulder. They're battling over you and what's inside of you. Soul. We cannot describe what it's worth. It's also saying there's no working or buying your way into heaven. You know, I'm a country music fan. And back before I was a preacher, sometimes I liked country music by some bands that probably preachers shouldn't listen to. And one of them was Confederate Railroad. Any of y'all ever heard of that group? Confederate Railroad. Went to a couple of their concerts. Kara's not in this service, so I'll tell you, when she and I got married, the theme song for my life was the song Trashy Women. And the line goes, I like my women just a little on the trashy side. <laughs> I could sing the whole song, but I'm not going to the, uh, but for time's sake. Um, but anyway, another one of their songs, though, has the line in there. I've never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. So you're going to meet your maker. And all this stuff that you have, or all this stuff that you've done, ain't going to amount to a hill of beans when your soul is either going to be in heaven or hell for eternity. So we've got to get this right. Verses 38 of chapter 8 through verse 1 of chapter 9. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Assuredly, Christ says, absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt, this is going to happen. Then he talks about this generation, this sinful generation. I think he was talking about that point in history he was looking around and he was saying, this is a sinful, sinful generation in time. We have the, the Roman world, the Greek world that is practicing all types of debauchery that does whatever they please for their senses. And then we have, and that, that's disgusting, and that's a sinful, sinful way to live. And then we have the Jewish religion who has turned this pure pursuit of God that it should have been into this legalistic rule book, set of rules that you have to follow, and it's not leading anybody to being right with God. It's just condemning people to hell. It is a sinful generation. And then he says, going to see the, saint, see the kingdom of God. What does it mean by that? Well, some might say he's talking about going to see the death and resurrection of Christ. Maybe. You know, it's when people sin, the work of Christ, for people's sin to be forgiven, that there's going to be people, Christ is talking to people, and you're going to see that occur. Maybe. He could have been talking about in, in A.D. 70 when Rome fell, the kingdom of God, the Romans, the empire that was ruling everything. It's gone away. I don't think that's the case, but maybe. The kingdom of God, maybe at Pentecost, when the church is birthed and the Holy Spirit descends and indwells believers and thousands of people are saved immediately. Maybe that is what's being discussed here. Now, I think personally, though, when Jesus says you'll see the kingdom of God to some of those people that were literally standing right there, he was talking about what we're going to talk about next time we're in the book of Mark, which is the transfiguration. You see, Peter, James, John, they're going to be up on a mountain with Christ. And they're going to see Christ in all of his glory. Shining so radiantly, they don't know what to do or think. I believe that's what Christ was saying. He was condemning them. He was saying, but some of y'all are going to see when I come back in my glory how great this is going to be for all of my followers. But how's this going to transform your life? See, I think as Christians, not, not amongst each other per se, I think we need to have a shoulder for each other to cry on. But I think out there in the real world that the real world is getting tougher and tougher against us. And as Christians, we're going to have to toughen up. We're going to have to plant our feet a little more firmly. 
And we're going to have to stand our ground, and we're going to have to say, no, this is what I believe. This is the truth. This is the good news of Christ. We're going to have to toughen up and be willing to step up and say it. We're going to have to quit with our reliance on things. And we're going to have to quit with our work for things other than, our, than his kingdom. We're going to have to exchange our will and our kingdom for his. But see, none of this stuff accurately depicts what Christ was saying. And this could be controversial, but this 2 minute and 26 second video is the closest thing after prayer all week that could happen and would happen today in the United States that Christ was preparing those people for that we read about in the passage and that Mark was pre preparing the Roman church for when he was writing this gospel so that they could get it and read it and be motivated. When the bombs blow up, it's gonna be awesome. Boom! The library will fall on the cafeteria. When they all run out, we'll be waiting outside to take them out. Time for a kickstart. Finally, we're gonna make things right. We'll be heroes. Heil Hitler, I can hear him now. If only we would have reached them sooner or, or found this tape. If only we would have searched their rooms. If only we would have asked the right questions. Too late. Give me the list. Who it is. That's the time. Should have went off already. Plan B. How'd you get through it? I don't know. There's no easy answer. But I don't think that God wastes anything. Not even the bad stuff. Is this some kind of prank? Go, go! Well, Rachel, where's your God now? What would Jesus do? <laughs> Do you still believe in God? You know I do. Then go be with him. April 20th, 1999, my senior year of high school. Columbine High School, Littleton, Colorado. You see, we look back on the cross and we can even twist the scriptures and make it sound like a good thing. But what Jesus was really teaching and what I'm called and have to preach, I can't twist it. He's told us to take up our cross and follow him. And having a flat tire on the way to the church house is not taking up your cross. We've got to refocus. We've got to know that following Christ is tough. Yeah. We've got to know that he's worth it. And that he won't be ashamed of us when he returns in all his glory. Because we might not know anything about hanging on a cross outside the city of Rome or for sure the city of Jerusalem. That right there, that gal took up her cross and followed Christ. You and I, we need to as well.
Shine upon you and be gracious to you. 